Good afternoon and welcome to the final fall installment of the diversity lecture series. I'm your host, Dr. B. Athena McNeely Cobham, Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer at Grand Rapids Community College. I am delighted to bring to you our guest speaker for today, Tuet Lay. For 19 years, Tuet Lay served as the Executive Director for Asian Americans Advancing Justice, a Pan Asian not for profit organization that builds power through collective advocacy and agency organizing to achieve racial equity. During her tenure, Ms. Lay grew the organization in staffing support, enhanced legal advocacy, civic engagement, and community organizing. As an independent consultant for nonprofits, Duet current board service includes Access Living, Point the Way, and One People's Campaign. She has also served as a panelist, keynote speaker, and rally speaker on a wide range of issues, including immigration, disability rights, census, redistricting, and political empowerment. Please welcome Grand Rapids, Tua Lay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. McNeely Cobham, um, and uh, thank you for the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Grand Rapids Community College for inviting me here to speak today. Um, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. Um, you know, I, we're living through these unprecedented uh, inflection points in our democracy and our civil societies. And our racial and socioeconomic chasms um, can no longer be ignored. Um, and so the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the epidemic of anti-Black uh, state violence is a wake up call. And, Turning away from these clear injustices have always been immoral and now it seems impossible. And so this is just a, a moment to reflect. And so I'm really um, happy that you are having me here to, to talk to um, your student body and community at large. It's our pleasure. Um, so like many of you, I'm trying to make sense of this historic moment and my role in it. And I don't have any clear answers, but I have a set of practices that I use that have guided me in um, creating meaning and purpose in my life. My first step is always to make sense of myself and what I value most, right? The next is understanding my history and my community and share the many ways that we are connected to each other. Um, and that was such a powerful practice that um, the land acknowledgement that this um, event opened up with. So I really wanna thank you for um, offering that to um, the audience here. And, and I hope that that is a practice that um, people continue throughout the events that they hold. My final practice is to take action, right? To test the theories and my values about what it makes, what it takes to make the world a better place um, for the most people possible. Um, and, you know, as my tenure as executive director, my job was to fight for equitable practices um, policies for Asian Americans, for immigrants, and for all marginalized and underserved communities. And to me, that meant um, I had to tell our stories as loudly as possible. But first, I had to figure out a way to tell my own story. So a few years into my job, I was asked to speak at an immigration conference, um, and I agreed. I thought it would be a workshop or a panel talking about the hardships of uh, Asian immigrants, right? Um, but it turned out they were asking me to speak at the plenary session, and there would be 500 people there, and I would have to follow a speech by the Archbishop of Chicago. And I am terrified of public speaking to this day. Earlier this morning, you should have seen me. Um, but, you know, but what's more is that they didn't want to me to talk about other people's experiences. They wanted me to talk very personally about why I had chosen to do social justice work, right? What motivated me to throw my life into this messy business when I could have been a dentist or an accountant or an IT manager or a lawyer, right? Which are the actual professions of my four siblings. Um, so what would I say to this audience, the largest that I had ever tried to speak in front of to that point? 
how could I tell this audience of strangers the things that I had not even admitted to myself? But I decided to do it and I started to put my story together, right? Why did I have a passion for this work? So I um, remembered one of my inspirations um, who was Harriet Tubman, right? Who I had met in Mrs. Simpson's fourth grade class during Black History Month, February, 1981. So even into adulthood, she remained one of my guides as the ultimate lesson in perseverance and shedding victimhood. Right? I had certainly grown up with my own disadvantages. Um, I could have looked, uh, I could have certainly looked at life through those lenses and certainly other people saw me through these lenses. And I had to deal with these realities um, of being a refugee, of being poor. Um, and I had to deal with other people's versions of my realities, their labels and the roles that they wanted me to play. Or I could choose to look at my other realities. I was going to be educated. I had a loving family. I was in a country that offered the best medical care in the world, and I would soon have the right to vote, right? Given all of these advantages that I had over Harriet Tubman, who was I to think that I couldn't do more than what was ascribed to me? So the morning of the plenary, um, it would set the tone for the conference. And I went to the conference without anything written out. Um, I started scribbling in the notes of the margins of my agenda when I should have been paying attention to the Cardinal. Um, and then that terrible moment arrived and it was my turn to speak. And I stepped in front of the microphone and stood there frozen. And then I decided to speak. Um, and I talked about expectations in this shaky voice that came out. The low expectations that people have in society of immigrants, the way those expectations define us, tell us who we can and cannot be, conspire to trap us. That I knew that I was the youngest as the youngest child and as a girl, as a Vietnamese person, as a refugee, as a person with a disability, no one really expected very much from me. And then I told this story and that the year after I graduated from Northwestern, my mother asked my sister to give me a newspaper clipping. And it was a want ad to work at a factory in Milwaukee where I grew up. I told my sister, uh, she told my sister, my mom told my sister that my dad could drive me to work at the factory every day. And that could have been my destiny. I could have been the girl who worked in a factory, who lived at home so her loving parents could take care of her. But I'm not, I said, I'm an executive director. And I had to pause before I could finish my speech, needing to absorb the impact of my own words, words that I had never spoken out loud, words that I never dreamed of saying in public. Then I recognized in that pause, 500 people were clapping for me before I could finish my speech. I looked up and felt this shock of recognition. And in that breathless moment, I had entered my public life. I sat down in this daze and the Cardinal said, good job. And later a Polish woman uh, came up to me and said, when I came to the United States seven years ago, I didn't speak English. And now I teach English to other immigrants. And she embraced me. And there we were two strangers hugging and crying in the hallway of a suburban school where the conference was held. I wasn't counting on going public that day and telling my story so openly and making it a part of this bigger community story. And public life certainly isn't just public speaking. It's agreeing to play our part in building a community your community. The public life is recognizing that our destinies are tied to the destinies of other people. Right, so that, that was the beginning of me being able to tell my story and talk about my values in a more public way. Um, and so I wanna talk more about Asian Americans and the work that I had done for so long and continue to do in a different way.
Um, for many Asian Americans, right, having our fates tied to other Asian Americans can seem arbitrary or even problematic. We come from different countries. We hold um, historic that the different countries that can hold historic and um, current animosities. We speak different languages and practice different religions, right? So if we can start the presentation. Um, so who are uh, Asian Americans? So if we can go to the first slide with the graph. Um, there are, you know, the census estimates that there are over 22 million Asian Americans in the United States. And we've been the fastest growing racial group for decades. Um, Asian Americans are a diverse group comprised of over 20 ethnic groups, including those from India, Pakistan, China, Southeast Asia, and so on. Right, um, and uh, a note on Pacific Islanders, which I will not be concentrating on in this presentation, but the US Census and policymakers had historically combined Pacific Islanders with Asian Americans, but the Pacific Islander community advocated for their data to be disaggregated to be able to better advocate for their issues. Um, you can think of the Asian American community in uh, this bimodal way um, that people uh, and communities exist on different ends of a spectrum that hides um, our challenges uh, when the data is aggregated together and presented as averages, right? So um, the next slide um, on uh, immigration, so if we go to the next slide on immigration. Okay, so again, these slides are presented just to give you uh, a, a, a general sense, right? The, I know the details are, are quite small, but that Asian, that the, when we mostly think about um, Asians and immigration, um, that we're more recent and largely immigrant. But Asian Americans actually have been in the United States um, documented uh, since the 1500s with settlements starting in. 1763, uh, right? Indeed, 59% are of us are foreign born, um, which is where the perception of being foreigners comes from. But in fact, a majority of Asian Americans are citizens, whether um, born in the United States or have become naturalized. And what's often lost in all of this is that there are about 1.7 million Asians in the United States who are undocumented. Right, so in this entire um, conversation about uh, immigration reforms, Asian Americans are largely left out of these conversations. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so when we think about income, largely Asian Americans are seen as having the highest um, household incomes, but you can see from this graph, the, um, the dots representing different ethnic groups really span a very broad range of income levels. Right, um, and while it may be true that certain ethnic groups, um, you know, do are successful, you can see how um, there's people on the, on the lower end. And one of the things to really note about Asian American incomes is that, um, you know, it's it's less driven by uh, all the things that we usually associate. And if you think about um, immigration laws that really uh, favor Asians who are able to get high paying jobs because they have specialized skills. Um, that's one of the factors that drives the incomes as well as many Asian Americans live in areas with high, um, higher cost of living that also pushes um, salaries to be higher. And that many households um, incomes actually are from many earners, right? Higher than um, typical households. Um, and even within ethnic groups like Asian Indians who have very high incomes, uh, they also have the largest undocumented community with over 600,000, right? So there are several contrasts um, within the Asian American group as a whole and even within ethnic groups. And so I think the idea here is to not always look at communities with this um, broad brush. And similarly, um, on the next slide, on education, you can see um, again, a really 
wide distribution of education and college attainment levels um, amongst the different ethnic uh, communities. Um, and uh, perhaps I seem to be making this argument that Asian Americans should not be viewed as a coherent racial group, right? And, um, you know, in the US, uh, race exists in this paradigm of black and white. And uh, it is a, a central conversation, to be sure. Um, Asian Americans are rarely talked about. Uh, but I think that including other racial groups is crucial if we are to fully understand the dynamics of white supremacy um, and how all of these groups um, are uh, fitting together or um, how we can think about this. Um, so if you go to the next slide, where do Asian Americans uh, fit when it comes to race, right? What does it mean to be Asian American? So this um, graph is by political scientist, Dr. Claire Kim, and it describes the racial triangulation of Asian Americans. And, um, and as the model minority, right, where we're, we're in the middle of this racial hierarchy between um, whites and blacks, and that as the story goes, you know, we're well-educated, high income levels, we're um, compliant. The success of Asian Americans is held up as a way to reinforce this bootstrap uh, uh, myth, right? That you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps and your successes of your own making. The message is that if one minority group has been able to make it, then racism must not be real and it must not be systemic. And it's something that can be overcome. Um, but as the uh, idea of the perpetual foreigner, right, we are considered outsiders. We're never truly American. Our loyalties are constantly questioned. Um, we have become convenient scapegoats during times of international conflict, right? As pets or as threats, each stereotype gets lifted at different times in service of white supremacy in order to hold on to power and resources. So we are not outside of this conversation, but Asian Americans are actually um, squarely placed in between, right? And, in, and serve, have a, a serve, uh, or serve a role as either a wedge or middleman um, in these power dynamics. So what does it mean to be Asian American, right? Um, given the complicated, uh, complicated ways that the community exists, why should we hold these groups together under one identity, right? Today, the term is used more as a census category or racial descriptor. And, um, and as such, it can seem very arbitrary. But the term Asian American was originally a political identity inspired by the Black uh, Black Power Movement. It was coined in uh, 1968 to signal a political coherence and a set of values that was committed to recognizing um, the interconnected immigra uh, immigration history, labor exploitations, racism, and a common political agenda, right? It was also a um, pushback on the term Oriental, which was uh, commonly used at the time to describe people um, from different Asian countries. And so certainly, um, if you look at, if you go to the next slide. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, so that, that one is uh, the um, Asian American identity. Um, next slide. Uh, and so, again, this idea of model minorities, um, Asian Americans aren't always um, speaking up, but certainly as in this survey, it shows that Asian Americans are experiencing, um, uh, you know, racism, right? And, um, you know, it's not something that the community talks about, and it's definitely not something that gets highlighted um, in mainstream media. Um, and so, um, while they're saying to pollsters that they experience discrimination, they're not necessarily filing reports with like the EEOC. Um, and so uh, while we may have vastly different cultures and history, the way Asian Americans are treated can be similar under these two stereotypes that I talked about. 
And uniting under a political identity can be a way of building political power to address these harms. So just to go into a little bit more detail about um, the uh, more specifics about the, the way these stereotypes play out, right? If you could go to the next slide. The perpetual foreigner, we're seeing this being played out right now in the middle of COVID, right? Um, this idea uh, creates a separation and gives permission to treat Asian Americans as a scapegoat and potential enemies. Um, throughout this pandemic, we have seen Asian Americans targeted. Um, President Trump um, has open animosity, calling it the Kung flu or China virus. It's meant to deflect deflect blame and provide a target. Um, his rhetoric contributes to an atmosphere where anti-Asian violence is acceptable. And indeed, we have seen Asian Americans be verbally and physically attacked in stores, on the streets, on nature trails, right? These are not happening um, in isolation of a larger political context and um, atmosphere. Right, someone needs to be blamed for something. Um, if you know, if it's a involves um, an Asian country, right? All of that overflows into the Asian American community. Um, and this is connected to a long history of the way that uh, specific Asian groups have been targeted when they are seen as a threat to economic prospects of um, white workers and corporations, right? And so. Um, in these moments, we always want to um, examine not just the history of politics, um, but also um, with labor movements and just seeing history as, as a larger whole. So we can go to the next slide. Um, many of you may be familiar with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1865, right? And what, what I want to do is connect this that this is around the same time as the Civil War is uh, ending, slavery is nearing its end, the same year um, Chinese uh, indentured servants are being brought over um, to build the transcontinental railroad and, the plant, uh, and work on plantations um, as cheap labor, right? Um, but th these Chinese workers are suffering uh, enormous abuses, right, sacrificed, in mortally dangerous work. They, um, and when they try to fight back and hold a strike, um, it's broken, the strike is broken by starving the workers. Um, and so, you know, they're seen as these racial rivals to white industrial laborers. And when the railroad is completed, the cheaper travel allows um, Chinese laborers to be replaced by white laborers from the East Coast. And so this racial animosity eventually leads to the Chinese Exclusion Act of um, uh, 1882. Sorry, I think one of my dates was um, wrong up there. It's the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Um, and that um, it marked for the first time legislation was enacted to prevent a specific ethnic group from entering this country. Um, and again, you see this in 1942 with Japanese Americans, um, at the Japanese American internment, right? Where uh, about 120,000 people of Japanese descent, two thirds of whom were US citizens were put in concentration camps during World War II. And uh, you know, while it was seen largely as justified as a necessity of national security, there were strong interests by white agricultural industry that saw the success of Japanese American farmers on the West Coast as an economic threat, right? And they were big advocates for pushing for the order. Um, one of the uh, leaders of that movement saying, you know, it's a question of whether the white man lives on the Pacific Coast or the brown man. Right, making it very clearly a racial um, issue. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it's just actually a matter of looking like the enemy, right? So if you go to the next slide. Um, some of you may be familiar with the murder of Vincent Chen, which took place in Michigan. Uh, he was a Chinese American who was killed by two auto workers 
in 1982, one of whom had been recently laid off. And during this time, the American car industry was being outmatched by Japanese automakers. Um, it didn't really matter to them that this engine was not Japanese, nor, was, um, nor uh, that any Japanese person should have been blamed for their unemployment. Um, the two men uh, were convicted, but only given probation and a small fine. And the sentencing judge said, you know, these, are, these weren't the kind of men you send to jail. You don't make the punishment fit the crime, you make the punishment fit the criminal, right? And so these, this is a, you know, an ex exceptional way to view two men, right? The, the kind of men you sent to jail, right? Evaluating that. Um, and again, you know, we saw in the aftermath of 9-11, the first South Asian killed was a Sikh Indian American um, working at a gas station. Um, and of course we see uh, what follows was intense racial profiling of Muslim Americans leading up to several attempts to ban them from entering the United States altogether. Um, but of course, again, you know, whether we were confused for um, who they were really intentionally trying to victimize, the, the question is, you know, uh, uh, or the, the real point is that no one should be uh, victimized, right? Um, and so turning to um, the model minority uh, myth, if you go to the next slide, um, you know, I think a lot of times people think of this as a good stereotype and that maybe that benefits us, right? Um, and, uh, you know, but it also, um, but really what is happening is that it sets these unrealistic expectations for Asian Americans, right? It denies our abilities to do something outside of the stereotype, right? Um, and, uh, and so, um, and, and thirdly, it denies Asian American communities of the resources that they need to mitigate um, poverty or some of the other issues that I raised in, that you could see in the statistics that I had shared, right? And, and to live a, a life free of discrimination. And so the way this had played out in Chicago and with the youth that uh, my organization was working with and organizing with, right? We found that these students um, not only had a lack of academic support, right, for these students, um, you know, the teachers just assumed that they would do well and never checked in on them. Uh, you know, for those whose um, uh, English was not the first language, um, it was especially challenging uh, because, you know, those coming from um, smaller ethnic groups like Cambodian or Lao, um, they were largely ignored by the school system. And on top of that, because the school, the schools did not have those resources to support those students, the students themselves would then face an extra burden where they were being pulled out of classes to interpret for parents and other students themselves losing their own class time. Um, so let's go to the next uh, slide. So. Um, you know, I want to, in, in this moment, I want us to talk about um, what, um, you know, uh, what our role is in um, uh, what is happening now, this racial reckoning, uh, reckoning that is happening. And just to acknowledge that Asian Americans um, have played roles in perpetuating anti-Blackness, right? Um, and, uh, um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so being in this middleman role, we really have to examine um, what we've been doing. Um, and there's, you know, different ways that um, Asian Americans have been compl uh, complicit. One is um, there is a, a often um, equating whiteness with success and prosperity and wanting to be white, right? There's um, skin whitening that happens in the community, eyelid surgery to look more white, uh, things like that. So um, again, um, uh, approximating whiteness. Um, uh, the second is the idea of accepting problematic media representations as accurate, right? Um, they're not, uh, you know, not challenging the stereotypical ways that um, uh, Black people are portrayed um, in very problematic, uh, you know, 
TV shows, news, et cetera. Um, a third can be in the way of, you know, certainly as I talked about, Asian Americans are experiencing racism, but equating that with 400 years of violent oppression, right, is a way of actually erasing um, the, uh, erasing that um, oppression, right, that, that those, our experiences are equal is, um, you know, makes, is, is almost like our own version of all lives matters. Right, and again, of course, it's important, but it's not equal. And there is a moment where we need to pay a lot of attention to what is happening um, to uh, to black communities and black people. Um, and I think the the other really problematic part is um, calling out racism selectively and when it is beneficial um, in a in a way that is beneficial only to Asian Americans. Right, there is. A uh, police officer, Peter Lang, who was convicted of killing Akai Gearley, um, who was a black man. Um, and, you know, the Asian American community came out in droves to call out racism, um, uh, that it was only a non white police officer who was getting charged. That's completely legitimate. But, um, you know, rather than calling fairness for the victim and that white officers should also be held accountable, their instincts was to protect their own and to say that he should not be um, charged at all, right? So, so where is the, the justice and fairness for the victim um, of these police officers? Uh, and again, serving and being willing to serve as the model minority wedge, right? A lot of focus um, is uh, on Asian Americans working against affirmative action in college admission, right? Um, being a part of this lawsuit against Harvard and other Ivy League schools um, that, you know, if you look into it, is spearheaded and funded by um, a white lawyer, right? Uh, and so it's just reinforcing this bootstrap myth um, mythology um, and not looking at other policies, um, you know, that are supporting white student admissions like legacy. Uh, policies and, and looking at athlete programs. Um, and what is missed often in this conversation is that in fact, most Asian Americans do support affirmative action programs, right? Um, and some groups like Southeast Asians do benefit um, in the academics from these programs and Asian Americans see it as supportive in employment for sure. So post-college is a, an essential part of how Asian Americans think about um, you know, their prospects. And so what I want to argue is that, you know, we are, um, uh, our, our fates are uh, linked, right? Um, so if you can go to the next slide. Um, you know, there are these moments um, that, uh, oh yeah, oh, sorry. Okay, so um, we can see that when, uh, you know, the forces like white supremacist forces are strong, um, they don't just target one group. They're often successful at uh, oppressing um, all minority groups, right? And laws that oppress black populations are often um, later used against Asian Americans as well, right? And so, um, you know, we're, in these moments where used to play off of one another to serve white economic interests and political power. Um, so, you know, this is some of the things that I talked about in terms of like the, the different laborers um, being played off of one another um, shortly uh, after war, the Civil War, right? And you can see, um, again, these are the, this uh, cartoon around this, this Chinese wall Right, it's a it's a you know an old iteration of something that is um, trying to happen now, right? And so like there, as much as we distinguish ourselves from one another, in some ways we're often then just kind of lumped together. And so we have to um, understand where we fit into um, these dynamics, right? And these racial dynamics. Um, and so our and and so our fates are really linked, whether we choose to see it that way or not. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, okay, and then, the, and then the next slide after that. So that was, sorry, that was the Chinese wall. Um, um, so 
some of the ways um, that, and again, like when we see our lives as linked, right, you can look back in history and see the ways where, um, you know, the efforts of Black Americans have really uh, helped Asian Americans. Um, the Immigration and Natural, uh, Nationality Act of 1965 um, is very much a part of the civil rights movement, uh, putting pressure on, uh, putting pressure on to change U.S. immigration laws, which were seen as racist, right? Prioritizing Northern Europeans over everyone and limiting entry from most places, um, barring um, most people from Asia. And when this law passed, it became the single largest factor driving the rapid growth of the Asian American community. We largely would not be here in this many numbers without this law and, um, and the pressure that the civil rights movement put um, into passing it. This other newspaper uh, story, or uh, this article is actually an ad from the New York Times in 1978, um, advocating um, to accept Southeast Asian refugees, right? It was put uh, in um, by a long list of um, Black civil rights leaders um, and, you know, uh, supporting um, refugees to be, to be allowed to uh, come to the United States, like those who had been um, living in these camps uh, outside of Vietnam. Um, and, you know, in these examples, I don't want it to seem that our support for Black communities should be transactional, right? They did something for us, we should help them out now. Um, but it can be a, a hook, right? A way to start reframing a conversation with um, people who are not interested or have a different view, a very stereotypical view, for example. Um, and But we should be um, supporting everyone's freedom and dignity. And one of the lines that I found in that ad um, that I found particularly compelling that the civil rights leaders wrote is that they wrote, through our arduous struggle for civil, political, and economic rights in America, uh, we have learned a fundamental lesson. The battle against human misery is indivisible, right? And so this is sort of a transformational way of um, interacting with um, each other as humans. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, so uh, again, just some of the things that people are doing now, right, that I find really exciting um, is to see Japanese Americans who have been organizing under this Never Again Is Now campaign, right? So those who have been incarcerated are um, talking about uh, releasing immigrants from uh, who are being detained at the borders and connecting that uh, immigration at, to Black lives and are talking about prison abolition, right? This is a really different, um, you know, moment than when I started organizing 20 years ago and Japanese Americans said immigration wasn't their issue even, right? And, um, you know, uh, there was a, another project called Letters for Black Lives that started um, when uh, the movement for Black Lives first uh, started six years ago or so. And it was a set of letters that were translated into different languages that um, younger folks could use to open up conversations with their immigrant parents or loved ones or family members, right, whose language, uh, first language was not English, um, whose first experiences were not necessarily positive with um, uh, other, uh, with Black Americans, right? And so it was a way to have um, a conversation with their loved ones, which, you know, I think we had uh, not been having those difficult conversations in our communities. Um, and so the, if we go to the uh, next slide, um, so what is the path forward, right? Um, if you can go to the very last slide or to the next slide. Um, yeah, so we want to, again, continue to reflect, right? Hopefully you won't have to come up with a speech to make that as an excuse to reflect. The second part is um, awareness. I think if you tap, there should be a, a circle that comes up on awareness. Um, and 
of action, right? Um, and, you know, when we discover our identities and commit to showing up as our full selves, it'll create this space for others to show up too, right? And then the, the last one in terms of action, right? The path forward really relies on each of us to do our parts in building our communities. And so I, I believe that that action part is something that we're all um, filling in um, as, as we make our way through these, this moment. So thank you very much. Joette, thank you so much. Um, that was a great synopsis of a lot of uh, a myriad of issues that are <laughs> happening you know, in our society and, and all at once. Um, if you and I can kind of just start a dialogue as I'm watching, yeah. the clock, we'll, we'll stay to our hour, maybe go five minutes over uh, to our audience in YouTube. If you have a question or comment, please send it via email to odei at grcc.edu. That's O for office, D for diversity, E for equity, I for inclusion at grcc.edu. Uh, our friends here in Zoom, you can use the Q&A tab and post your comment and question there, and I'll be able to read that back out. And in Facebook land, um, please comment in the chat, and that will get back to me as well. Um, so while we're waiting for people to join into the conversation, um, as I was listening to you, one thing that came to mind was this idea that when it comes to racial group comparative statistics, right, about uh, the number of students, let's say, who succeed academically or who may be struggling, uh, academically, um, the looking at mainstream media, when they start to talk about polls and voters and their sentiment, I hardly ever hear about the Asian community and what they might be thinking about the political climate, um, the pandemic, its impact, so forth and so on. Could you give insight uh, from your both lived and worked experience, why the narrative and the, the realities of our uh, Asian American brothers and sisters are often left out of those conversations. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think as a whole, um, well, I, more recently, I think just statistically, there's more Asian Americans to be able to join those polls um, and and show up in a way, um, you know, to be reflected. But uh, I think before that, uh, we were still a relatively small community, right? But I think at this point, it's just um, an excuse, right? There's enough of us, there's ways to, um, you know, show um, how, uh, you know, the, there's ways to collect that information to um, demonstrate how much of, or what Asian Americans think. And there are resources, um, AAPI data does a lot of um, uh, polling um, on political attitudes, on, um, uh, attitudes about social issues. That's where some of the information that I got. So, you know, people often think it's too complicated to figure out how to work with Asian Americans. There's so many languages, you have to oversample all of these things. But I mean, clearly there's just ways to overcome them if that is your priority. And I think Asian Americans just historically haven't been a priority. Um, some of it, you know, at, when we were small, maybe legitimate, but some of it too, I think it's, um, I think we're known not to complain, <laughs> uh, you know? And so uh, I think that, yeah, I, I think if you are louder about these things, but uh, some of that might um, start to change more, but I think it's just a devaluing of um, Asian American opinions. And, um, you know, just because it's that simple, doesn't mean it's not important. And it's clearly been demonstrated that it's possible. Mm -hmm. I want to expound on that. What about from a voting block framework? Are mm. there um, particular platforms that come up as a priority? And again, I know when we say Asian American community, it's so broad. It is. But the same could be said for the Black community who makes up, right, Caribbeans, those born right here in America, and those who might be um, from Africa, second or third generation. So no group is monolithic. Um, but if you could tackle that, is there a uh, two or three priority items that show up as a um, uh, uh, voting block sort of a platform um, that members of the Asian community stand on? Yeah, I, um, you know, I don't know, it, you know, when you, when you ask people, and this is 
seems very similar to the um, information I've seen on like Latinx voters, meaning that when you ask them, it's the same as what everybody else cares about, jobs, um, you know, the economy and, uh, you know, the healthcare, things like that, right? I, I think, um, and it's not immigration. I mean, we did used to do polling in Chicago and be like, cloud immigration, but, you know, they're like, no, I just need a job. But, like, um, but I think it certainly affects uh, Asian Americans quite a bit and how people talk about it. I mean, I think that being said, right, um, California uh, has a huge um, Vietnamese population in um, Orange County, which is the county itself is very Republican. The Vietnamese community tends to be Republican um, as it uh, tends to be very um, anti-communist. And, but when there was like more anti-immigrant um, policies being proposed in California in the nineties, the community started turning away from the Republican party, right? It was a, a growing, um, maturing younger community that was growing, uh, that was turning away, but um, it, you know, older folks who were seeing their social safety network being, um, you know, destroyed by this proposal were like, hey, what's going on? Maybe this is not the right place for me. So I think that, um, you know, people still have their self-interest, people still um, have ways that they're operating as immigrants. And so those are some of the things, but I think for the large part, it's hard to draw. Uh, I, I mean, I, if I could talk about it for an hour and give you insights, but I think in this time, time, um, yeah, it's hard to say. Uh, right. And, and I raised that question. I, I'm sort of always intentional. I was reading an article where it highlighted uh, about the number of Asian Americans that were uh, unemployed due mm -hmm. to the pandemic. And one of the great pillars here in the Grand Rapids community were Facebook friends. Uh, said, you know, why is it that this issue doesn't rise to the occasion in our media cycle, right? Um, and so that stayed with me and I read the article yeah. and I said I would keep it for our conversation, right? Um, just yeah. about what, what might be the political platforms. Um, you've mentioned immigration and I want to stay with that. And I do see your question, Corey, I'm gonna come to you in a minute. Um, much of the polarizing rhetoric around citizenship or immigration or quote unquote, one who is illegal. And let me just shout out and say, this is not my quote, but nobody can be illegal on stolen land. Mm -hmm. right? that's, that's Dr. MC saying that, right? Don't charge it to GRCC. But with that said, um, a lot of the images that are shown to us through that media canon is often time of um, people from right Latin, Latin countries, South America, that sort of thing, crossing the border, uh, you know, coming over a fence, so forth and so on. So in your own presentation, you raised the point that that foreigner concept has always been put on the Asian American community, but yet it doesn't show up as a almost a pictorial or photographic representation when that conversation happens. Any insight about why that might be? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think often the media likes to just tell its own story over and over again, <laughs> right? And, um, you know, it's, it's very much lost uh, as a part of the conversation. They want to go with like, where's the biggest splash? Where's the biggest numbers and those types of things. And I actually remember, I mean, I, sometimes I just say the same things over and over again. I surprise anyone um, listens, but I was at this uh, ABC seven Chicago would do this um, uh, half hour special for Asian American Heritage Month. And they ended up actually doing this entire half hour on Asian American uh, immigrant experiences, right, from their own newscasters to different community members to my organization's advocacy on immigration. And at this luncheon, when they introduce it, they're like, oh, uh, Twet has been bothering me about this for the longest time. So we finally did this. And I was like, oh, okay. So I just think that people, um, again, I think this is why, you know, advocacy is so important. Like you really have to put out your own stories. We also have to have people willing to tell those stories, right? right? The number of camera shy Asian Americans, right? Um, and it's a cultural thing, but there's certainly at this point, many young people willing to speak up. I think news has to be pushed to seek these stories. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So I'm gonna to go to a question in the queue from Corey. Uh, says the governor of New York recently said COVID came from Europe. Uh, do you think our federal government 
um, wants to blame China instead of Europe, if I'm reading that correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't, at this point, it's like, um, I leave, I mean, I don't know what's useful to blame, but if it's useful to blame people, right? I mean, right. what, what are we doing with this information other than stirring up fear or hatred? Like, are we solving the problem? Does this get to solving the problem? That's my question. Like what, and I think part of this is like, and that's what all of these things are, which is a distraction from us figuring out how to be well as a society, right? I mean, we can keep being angry at each other, but that's not gonna, I think we know where that's all gonna lead, right? right. Um, so yeah, I don't think it's a useful um, activity at this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is a, a bit lengthy. It's a comment slash question. Um, one of our professors, you speak very earnestly about a desire for unity, which I share. I noticed that one of the issues you address is that the older generation had bad experiences with the Black community. I've lately been thinking that we have an ability to admit our parents were othering as a way to elevate themselves in social standing. Do you think there might be ways in which younger Asians still fall into the trap as many white people do? When you talk about awareness and reflection, do you discuss current forms of othering and how to transform othering into unity? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I, I think that, uh, you know, again, I'm gonna have to talk in generalizations. I do think that younger people, because they have, I think, Younger people have a lot more um, uh, interactions with diverse communities than they ever did, even you know, as when I was a young person, and definitely for my parents' experience. So I think that interaction in and of itself um, creates a uh, unity, right? It's hard to like really hate someone or see them in this broad brush when they're right next to you or you're interacting with them or you're having positive experiences with people, right? But certainly there's lots of um, Asian Americans, lots of people who are still very much in homogenous communities, right? Or communities, yeah. So, um, so that lack of interaction, I think people can, um, you know, uh, not have a full understanding, um, choose to distance themselves. And I think there's still like, you know, there's a lot that people should be personally responsible for, but there's a lot that the media does to create, um, a, you know, a, a certain view of different communities. And there's a lot of ways our um, systems support, um, you know, these stereotypes in our communities as well. And so um, it's, it's up to us to kind of start seeing those things. Um, but I, I do think like just the interaction that we have um, it's getting better, but if we're not being intentional, it doesn't have to get better. Right. Thank you for that. What's some of the um, things that you're reading? What's what's on your radar that keeps you going during this time period? Oh my goodness, what keeps me going? Um, I actually uh, I'm reading um, Hood Feminism right now, and mm -hmm. I, uh, I have not opened Cast up yet, but I love. Uh, I love Isabel Wilkerson's previous book, Warmth of Other Suns. Um, it is one of my favorite books, even though it's super long and I'm not a big reader, but it's fantastic <laughs> for everyone. Um, so I'm super excited to recast. Um, yeah, just like really, what's exciting to me is just like, I mean, how much, um, I mean, I think her first book was really successful, but just like that people are excited to read things like this right. now. Right. right. Um, so just that level of engagement is I'm like, wait, are we going to really solve racism in my lifetime? I just used to say that, but maybe. <laughs> so um, on my very optimistic days, I, I try to hold on to that. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm getting uh, questions <laughs> handed to me via phone and everything. <laughs> so, um, one of the questions is, could you unpack uh, even further, the model minority myth and, and, and sort of the impact of that in our society. I almost think it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? Yeah. Um, that what you talked about in your presentation is that it, it 
the burden of what that creates, right, for members of members of the Asian American community. And at the same time, the, the other side of that sword is um, how oftentimes it might be leveraged to distance oneself from mm -hmm. the things that might be ha happening in other marginalized communities. So can you unpack that more from, again, from your own work and lived experience, uh, model minority 2.0, sort of where we are with that now? <laughs> sure, I mean, it's a, it, it is really difficult. You know, it's hard to tell people like, oh, you're not that smart. Like, like you know, bust the myth. You're not that smart like that. No one wants to admit that, right? Um, it, so it, it's hard to get folks to really look at that. But I think if they really, um, for Asian Americans, I think really investigating that they see the limitations that it offers as well. You know, what most people don't, talk about um, is, you know, the, the highest rate of suicide is amongst um, younger Asian American women, hmm. right? Or just the rate of suicide in general amongst Asian American college students, right? I don't, I don't even see statistics, but anecdotally, you just see it everywhere, you know? And so, um, you know, there is intense pressure. So yeah, you may want to get into that school, but like that drive for, um, uh, perfection, um, right? And then what does it mean when you aren't able to meet it? I, I think in the social media age, it just gets even more intense, right? When you're constantly, I mean, just think about the idea of um, that anyone has about comparing themselves to other people, right? Right, And uh, you're, you're feeling not enough. And when your whole race supposedly is a bunch of smart people and you're an A minus or a B plus, like then do you feel like you're failing your entire race? Do you feel like you're failing your family, your community? That is an intense amount of pressure to have. Um, but yeah, certainly I think there is ways that um, it gets leveraged um, and that you have, you know, Asian Americans have probably um, like a halo effect amongst um, minority groups, right? Sort of like, oh, if I have to pick some brown person, I'll pick an Asian person because at least they, you know, can mimic whiteness or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, and but again, like at what cost do we play into those roles is the question that we should be asking ourselves. Right, appreciate that. Uh, just to the audience, a lot of times people are shy to type, but uh, Tuet is with us for two more minutes. This program yeah. concludes at 3.30. So if you have a question to ask, uh, type away. Um, in, in the meantime, um, to it, if you could, um, any sort of closing thoughts that you have uh, to offer us um, as we move, what are we about 14 days from? Um, aha, got a question. Yeah, and so you can end on this. I, I like that question. Okay. Thank you, James. Um, what are some ways, as your parting comments, to promote inclusion in groups? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think it's really important to bring as much of yourself as possible and, and like, especially the messy parts, you know, mm -hmm. I, I um, did not, I grew up with a disability my entire life, but I really have only had a politicized disabil disabled identity for the last five years. Uh, and I, I do a lot of work in that area now, but I'm still really much growing into it, right? And so, um, you know, I didn't know, I mean, I help nonprofits, I see that um, helping, but I had a family member, a close member who um, was recently, you know, diagnosed with MS. And I think what I realized um, is my ability to talk about my disability in, um, one, just a factual way, a fact of life, but also in a positive way in the ways that it has benefited me. Um, they started seeing their disability and claiming that identity and seeing it as something that doesn't necessarily have to stop them. It may mean they have to do things differently and that society has not been built for them. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. It might be something wrong with the way society views people with disabilities. Right, and so just uh, bringing your full self into that, um, and again, that authentic self allows um, other people to thrive as well. Right, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you um, always transparent with our audience. We were scheduled to do this back in March, 
Yeah. And and the world shifted, right? Yes. Um, and so um, you were a great sport about being able to come to us this fall and certainly virtually. So very much appreciate it. Um, our next event will be a post-election town hall to our audience on November 4th at 11 a.m. Um, I'm not going to make any predictions. I'm just going to say, uh, please join us for a conversation sort of about our political selves um, and the role that we need to play beyond the presidential election. So again, that's November 4th virtually at 11 a.m. And thank you so much to uh, the team with GRCC Media, Tuet, and everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Take care. Thanks.